I believe we are on. Um, I'm going to give it just a moment for a few people uh, to log on. Good afternoon, everyone. We, uh, we're expecting a really big crowd today, so I just want to give people a couple extra minutes to log on, and then uh, we will get started. Um, Hopefully everybody was able to stay up last night and watch the Phillies game. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that are that are fans, uh, I, I was doing a uh, a little um, count before this uh, call started, and we have clients in ten different states and uh, multiple countries uh, actually on the call today. So uh, if you're not uh, rooting for the Phillies wherever you are, shame on you. Um, <laughs> We here in the office are big Phillies fans. Uh, okay. We've got about half of the people I expected, so I'm just going to give it another minute or so. So Matt, where, 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 or what are you a fan of? What? <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm a Red Sox guy when it comes to baseball. So we're sitting this one out, but Phillies are an unbelievable story. So I, I've thrown my name in as the bandwagon fan for them. Uh, that works. It's fun watching home runs, and they hit a bunch of them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Boston's had a couple down years here when it comes to baseball. So no October for us. Yeah, you know, you you, I I, I don't feel bad. Um, you know, Boston's yeah. had their fair of championships over the last uh, twenty years in a number of sports. So, yeah, I certainly can't complain. It had to end at some point, but yeah, all those championships, yeah. we'll take those with us. Uh, so I guess we can get started. We've we've got uh, a whole uh, chunk of people on. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sal Cosavara, president of Cora Capital Advisors, and welcome to uh, the October presentation of Cora College. Uh, we'd like to welcome Matt Kelleher. Matt is with MFS Investments uh, from Massachusetts, sadly, and uh, is going to be speaking with us today on uh, the very popular topic of Social Security. And uh, he's going to go through a number of different uh, areas of Social Security, the different uh, methodologies and strategies uh, for claiming Social Security. Uh, this, this is something that is a huge topic in our office. Uh, core Capital, I always like to say at our core, is a financial planning firm first. And probably the biggest decision that most clients uh, will ask us to help them with is when to start collecting their Social Security and how best to strategize around that. And like so many things in life, uh, there is no rule of thumb. There is no specific way that someone should handle it. It is very unique to one's own situation, facts, and circumstances. So as we work with our clients in going through this process, uh, we do uh, pay very close attention to what's going on in your particular life. We then, uh, where, where it's possible and appropriate, uh, we link in our sister uh, firm, Barrett's and Associates, the CPA firm, and we work with them to make sure that whatever decisions we may be uh, talking about on the planning side also makes sense on the tax side, because like anything that we, we do from a planning perspective, we always have to look at uh, the tax aspects associated with this. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to hand it off uh, to Matt and kind of let him take over. There is at the bottom of everyone's screen, uh, you'll see a Q&A button, um, and we would ask you to please um, submit your questions through there, and uh, we'll work on answering them as best we can. At the uh, conclusion of this, uh, we will have some uh, handouts, essentially, that we can uh, email out to everyone. This presentation will is also being videotaped and will be stored on the YouTube channel that Cora Capital has. Just go on YouTube and search for Cora Capital. 
Uh, and also for anyone that is coming into the office, uh, these, these booklets that we're going to email out, we also have hard copies of them in the office to provide to you as well. So with that, Matt, the floor is yours. Perfect. Well, thank you for the intro, Sal, and thank you everyone for taking some time out of your day to come uh, listen to us speak here. And as Sal mentioned, the main topic for today is going to be Social Security. Just want to go over some of the major components of it, kind of what to understand as you head into making that decision. And so hopefully a good amount of people on the call today have gotten the chance to look at your Social Security statement. For anyone who hasn't, I definitely would recommend hopping on to ssa.gov, signing in and creating your My Social Security account because there is a lot of really helpful information contained in these statements. For those of you who have actually taken a look at this though, I'm sure a lot of time has been spent maybe looking at the different benefits that you qualify for at different ages, maybe looking at that earnings history, just seeing kind of the career path that you went on. But one area that I wanna focus on is an area that I think a lot of people overlook. It does just get lost in kind of this big blob of text here on the right. And that's where it says social security benefits are not intended to be your only source of income when you retire. And I think that is a really key point. And when you look at the numbers, it really only comes out to about 40% of that pre-retirement income that social security is really designed uh, to take over. And so as Sal mentioned, this is an extremely unique and personal type of journey and complicated uh, decision-making process that you have to go through here. And so when it comes to that other 60%, the puzzles or the puzzle pieces are all going to be different for each and every one of you. No two people are going to look the same when it comes to that plan. Uh, so before we get into the nitty gritty, I really would recommend sitting down with Sal or a member of the Core Capital team and having that one-on-one -on -one planning discussion where you are bringing in all these different assets because we aren't just looking to maximize the social security benefit of it, even though that is the conversation today. It's really that full retirement income picture. And that does involve a lot of these outside assets that are gonna be different for each individual. But diving into what we're actually gonna to cover today, we'll start with how those retirement benefits are actually calculated. We'll get into some of the benefits available for anyone who's been married, so both married couples as well as divorcees, and then finally finishing things off with that all-important conversation on taxes and how that uh, fits into your overall retirement plan. So getting going here with how the retirement benefits are actually calculated, and one of the numbers that I really want you to keep in mind, one of the most important numbers that we'll cover today is your full retirement age. And you'll see, based on the year that you were born, this number can range anywhere between 66 and 67 years old. And the reason we really want to focus on that is because all of these Social Security benefits are in some way tied to that full retirement age, and then your decision on when you decide to claim relative to that. And so just before we go on, I want to make sure everyone has a chance to take a look at the year you were born, figure out what your full retirement age is, and then just kind of lock that away because it is important information to have when we're trying to figure out when we want to claim and the impact that might have. But moving on to the actual retirement benefits themselves. Uh, so what does it take to qualify for your own Social Security retirement benefits? Well, it's going to be 40 quarters that you're paying into the Social Security system. And then what the SSA is going to do to figure out the amount that they owe you is look at your 35 highest years of earnings average that out, plug it into a, an equation to get that monthly amount. Looking at the bottom here, you'll see that full retirement age. And as I mentioned, your decision on when to claim will have an impact on how much you're entitled to. And so you'll notice that full retirement age, you're entitled to 100% of those benefits. And then any decision to claim before that full retirement age, you will see some permanent reductions in your retirement benefit. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, for any year after your full retirement age that you decide not to claim and push that back a little bit, you will get an 8% what they call delayed retirement credit. Uh, so essentially an 8% bonus each year you claim after full retirement age. And one thing to note there, I know inflation has certainly been top of mind for a lot of us over the last two or three years. That 8% is inflation adjusted. Each year, the Social Security Administration comes out with a cost of living adjustment. Uh, they did that just the other week for this year 
This year, it's 3.2%. Uh, so certainly a drop off from last year when it was hovering around nine. Uh, but just important to note that 8% is adjusted for inflation each year. Now, one of the first questions that we're always gonna ask when we're considering if we wanna claim social security is, are you currently working? Because if you are deciding that you wanna continue work while trying to claim social security and you're under that full retirement age, we're gonna bump up into what's called the earnings limit. And essentially the social security administration puts a cap on how much income you can have while you're working and trying to claim social security. For this year, that number is gonna be $21,240. And at that point, for every $2 of earnings you have above that limit, you'll start to see a dollar of benefits withheld. This isn't permanent, they're not taking that money away forever, but it is important to note that you could see some withholdings if you're deciding to continue working while trying to claim. Now, a few good things when it comes to this earnings limit, uh, it's just looking at wages. So any unearned income that you have from something like a pension, an IRA or a rental income, that's not gonna be included in this number. So it won't count against you. It's also only looking at the earnings and the wages that you receive after you start social security. Uh, so if you expect to have some major lump sum wages coming in in the future, could be a good idea to make sure we start social security after you receive that since anything after they're taking a look at, anything before you're good to go. And then finally, if you are married, social security is only looking at the wages of the spouse who is trying to receive social security. Uh, so whatever your spouse is making shouldn't have an impact uh, on the earnings limit and won't have uh, any impact when it comes to, are you gonna see some withholdings on those benefits? Now, getting into a couple of the options that we have for both married couples, as well as divorcees, I'm gonna start with the spousal benefit. Now, I think the most important thing when it comes to the spousal benefit is the fact that it is always based on your spouse's FRA benefit. And so that means no matter when your spouse claims, whether that's 62, 67, 70, the amount that you're entitled to will always be based off of what they'd receive at their full retirement age. And so we'll take that amount and then the percentage of that that you're entitled to does come down to when you decide to claim this benefit. And you can see here the range of those percentages. It's a bit different based on your full retirement age, uh, but looking at someone with an FRA of 67, the minimum amount would be 32 and a half if you claim it at 62, all the way up to 50% when you hit that full retirement age. Uh, now, good news with this is it is available even if you didn't work and don't have your earnings history, so you don't qualify for your own retirement benefit. The one thing there, though, is that your spouse must have already turned on their benefits before you can start to receive a spousal offer. Now, in the case that they forward, you will receive a greater of your retirement benefit or your spousal benefit. Um, so whichever one of those happens to be greater, the SSA will make sure that you are given that. Um, so something to keep in note there. Just want to drill down a little bit deeper into what we mean uh, when we're saying that it's always based on the FRA. And so to do that, we'll use America's favorite couple back in the 80s, Jack and Diane. And so looking at this, Diane is going to be the higher earner in this case. Jack's retirement benefit is less than his spousal. So we're going to try and take a look at what is Jack's maximum and his minimum spousal benefit going to be. And you can see at the bottom here, this is what Diane's annual social security benefit will be if she claims it's 62, 67, and 70. And so looking at the numbers here, you'll see each color represents the age that Diane decided to claim. So red for 62, green for 67, and blue for 70. And the big thing to notice here is again, no matter what age Diane claimed her benefits at, the spousal benefit that Jack's entitled to is always gonna be based on that full retirement age amount. And so if you remember the minimum that you can receive at 62 is that 32 and a half percent. Well, 3,250 is 32 and a half percent of that $10,000 that Diane would get at full retirement age. Same thing if Jack claims at 67, he's entitled to that 50%. But again, it doesn't matter when Diane claims for this benefit, it's always based on her full retirement age. And I think that's kind of a key misconception, a point we really want to focus on is that FRA benefit when it comes to spousal. Now, one thing that will come up with spousal is sometimes people look at what they're receiving 
and they say, hey, this isn't really lining up with those percentages. It's not 50% of my spouse's benefit. And the reason that we see this is the SSA does go through kind of one extra step when they're actually giving you the spousal benefit. Um, and so we'll look at a quick uh, equation here. And in this case, we're looking at what happens if that lower earning spouse applies first and the steps that they go through to get that final amount. And so when the lower earner spouse applies, they'll start with their own retirement benefit if they qualify. Remember, if you claim before your full retirement age, you could see some of those permanent reductions. Then when your spouse applies and you are now qualified to get this spousal benefit, what they're gonna do is top that current amount off with the excess spousal benefit. And so you'll see the equation they use on the bottom here. What that excess spousal benefit is, is just them taking a look at the maximum spousal benefit that you could get at your full retirement age and then subtracting your own retirement benefit, again, at FRA. And if that number is positive, they will add that to whatever you're currently receiving, and that will be the total amount. Um, so just want to look at another quick case study just to highlight that point a little bit more. So in this case, we're looking at three people here, Alex, Blake, and Chris. All three are 62, married, and retired. And what we want to look at is what will they receive from Social Security if they apply now at age 62, as well as when their spouse applies. And we're assuming that happens at age 67. And so here on the right, you can just see what their own retirement benefits would be, as well as what that spousal benefit would be. And so going one by one, we're going to start on the right with Chris. And so notice that Chris does not have a retirement benefit of his own. And so at age 62, his spouse hasn't applied does not qualify for his own retirement benefits. Good news for Chris though, is when his spouse applies, he's full retirement age. And so he's entitled to that max spousal benefit of $1,200 starting at age 67. Moving on to Blake. Uh, so Blake applies at 62. Remember since that's before his full retirement age, there are gonna be some reductions. When you apply at 62, you'll take 30% off. So instead of that 1,000, they will start with 700. And then as soon as his spouse applies, they're gonna look at the spousal benefit at FRA of 1,200, then the retirement benefit of 1,000, subtract that and you're left over with 200. And so he gets a total of $900 with that excess spousal top off. And then finally, we'll take a look at Alex. Same thing here applies at 62, takes 30% off. So he gets the $700. But then when we're looking at that spousal benefit versus the retirement benefit, Notice that they're the same, so there is no excess. At that point, even when the spouse applies, since there isn't an excess, they'll stick with that $700. Now, switching gears onto retirement benefits, a couple of differences here. First one being it is available a little bit earlier. So you can start at age 60, 50 if you're disabled, compared to 62 when we're talking about spousal. Uh, with all of these different benefits, again, that earnings test is applied until you reach that full retirement age. That applies to spousal, survivor, all of these. So the earnings test, if you are working, is in effect. Um, the biggest difference, though, is we just spent a lot of time talking about how spousal is all about that full retirement age benefit. That is not the case when it comes to survivor. And so if you see here under the amount based on, this is based on the age at which the deceased claimed their retirement benefit. And so the greater the deceased benefit, the greater the survivor benefit that they can pass down. And so in this case, their decision to claim does have impacts on the survivor benefit that they can leave behind. Now, similar to spousal, the percentage of that amount you're entitled to does come down to when you decide to claim the spousal or the survivor benefit. In this case, the minimum is 71 and a half all the way up to 100% of whatever that deceased spouse was receiving at the time that they passed away. Uh, just one other thing to note here. So if the surviving spouse claimed either their retirement or their spousal before their FRA, that's not gonna have an impact on their survivor benefit. Survivor benefit's always gonna be based on that percent uh, based on when the survivor claims. So you're not gonna be penalized for the fact that you took spousal and then your spouse passed away and you wanna switch over to survivor. And just to illustrate that real quick, in this case, hypothetical couple, at 65, they decide to claim Social Security. The lower earner receives a little over 1,000, the higher earner a little over 3,100. Now that continues up until age 75. When the higher earner passes away, 
since the lower earner is above their full retirement age, they'll step up to 100% of the benefit from that higher earner, no penalties or reductions. So going forward, they will be taking home that $3,125. Um, so again, only based on when you claim and then how much your spouse was receiving, no penalties if you would claim those others before your full retirement age. And I had mentioned the fact that the greater the benefit that deceased had, the greater that they can pass along in that survivor benefit. And I really think that is an absolute key when it comes to this presentation and Social Security in general. So I think this is a really important slide, uh, just going over how those decisions can be passed down. And the example I like to use a lot is the story of my grandfather. So hardworking man, eventually built himself up to owning his own dental practice. But when he hit 62, he had thought, all right, I've been paying into this system for decades now. You know, I don't know how much longer I have to live. I want to make sure I'm getting the most out of Social Security as possible. They owe me some money. I'm entitled to it, and I want it now. And so while he was really happy that he started getting those payments, felt like he was ringing Social Security for all it was worth, what he didn't think of is what impact it would have on my grandmother. And so looking at the charts here, we're showing the amount in survivor benefits that both the average earner in blue and max earners in green can assume that they're left behind based on whether they're claiming at 62, full retirement age, or 70. And so just under the assumption that my grandfather was an average earner, his decision to claim at 62, and he didn't need the money, this was just because he wanted to claim it, instead of leaving behind $35,000 a year for my grandmother if he had decided to claim at 70, he took a $12,000 haircut every year in the benefits that he could leave behind just because he really didn't think through the implications. And so that's why we're saying change this conversation from me to we. Another area of opportunity to go meet with Sal, go meet with your core capital team member. And instead of just you, bring your spouse in, have that full family conversation because these are decisions that have lasting impacts on your loved ones. And we wanna make sure we're factoring that in during this whole planning process. Now, moving on to divorcee benefits. Thing here is they are available as long as that marriage lasted at least 10 consecutive years. And the max spousal is still gonna be 50%. The max survivor is still gonna be 100%. There are a couple of requirements. So that ex-spouse does need to be at least 62, dead or disabled. The ex does not need to be receiving their benefits in order for you to turn yours on unless the divorce was less than two years ago. Uh, so if it was less than two years ago, same rules that we talked about for spousal apply, where that spouse needs to turn theirs on before you can turn yours on. If it was longer than two years ago, that no longer applies. And then one question that we get a lot is, will this impact you know, my spouse? Will they know? So receiving a benefit off of your ex is not going to reduce their benefit. If you don't want them to know, no one will tell them. I'm completely up to you. So that shouldn't be a factor when it comes down to, should I claim off of my ex? They will not know and it will not impact them. Looking at your current marital status, we'll get into this a little bit more on the next slide. The number that I want you to remember though is just age 60, because that's gonna be important. Um, and again, if you worked and have your own earnings history, they're again gonna look at giving you the greater of either your own retirement benefit or a spousal slash survivor off of the X. So whatever one is greater, they're looking to give you. And again, everything is subject to earnings test until you hit your full retirement age. But just diving a little bit more into that current marital status and what happens in the case of remarriage. Uh, so with that former spouse, if they get remarried, no impact. Uh, so you're not gonna have to split your benefits with the new spouse. Um, them deciding to get remarried has no implications. Your decision to get remarried though, can when it comes to the benefits that you're entitled to. And so again, we're going to look at that age 60, which is the important number there. So if you decide to get remarried before you turn 60, you're going to forfeit both of those benefits off of that first spouse. So both survivor and spousal are gone from the first. On the other hand, if you remarry after age 60, you'll still give up those spousal benefits off of the ex, but you can keep the survivor. And in the case that that second marriage ends for any reason, whether that's divorce, annulment, or death, you can become entitled to the benefits off of that first spouse, even if you did get remarried before age 60. And so just another quick case study, we'll use the 
kind of fictionalized life of Jane Fonda in this case. Her two marriages, and then what are her benefits at the end of it all? And so we'll start. Jane gets married to Tom at 25. They're married for 15 years before getting divorced, and Tom has passed away. Now, five years later, she marries Theo. Most people would know him as Ted. They're married for 10 years before getting divorced, and Ted is alive and well at age 62. And so after that second marriage, what is Jane entitled to in terms of Social Security benefits? Well, if she has her own earnings history, she's still entitled to her own retirement benefit. Since that second marriage had ended, she can still get that survivor benefit off Tom because their marriage lasted at least 10 years. And then since her and Ted also were married 10 years, she is eligible for both the survivor and the spousal off of him. And again, they're looking at whichever one will be greatest, and that is the amount that she will receive. Now, finishing up, here with a conversation on taxes and how that impacts the overall retirement plan. I think the first thing to note is just the fact that social security benefits can become taxable. And so you'll see here the thresholds that they're looking at for taxation. For individuals, it starts at 25,000, married couples filing jointly 32,000. And you'll notice that as that income increases, so does the amount of social security benefits that could become taxable. And so what exactly is this 25,000, that 32,000? Well, they're gonna be looking at what's called your combined income. And so looking at the equation here on the left-hand side, we have AGI, which stands for adjusted gross income. Really wide ranging measurement there. This is wages, pensions, capital gains, dividends, really, really a lot of things wrapped up into that AGI. Second, they're gonna take a look at any tax exempt income that you have. Uh, so think muni bonds. One of the best things about them is they're federal and state tax exempt. When it comes to combined income, though, the SSA is going to want to take a look at any income you have coming from there. And then finally, half of your Social Security benefits, you add all that up and you get your combined income. Now, for people that are concerned that taxes may be going up in retirement or just want to mitigate the tax bill that they owe, one thing to keep in mind is the fact that it's only half of your Social Security benefits that are getting wrapped up into combined income. And so if you can work with your investment professionals, member of Core Capital, to figure out ways that Social Security can account for a bit higher of a percentage from this total income, that could be a way to reduce that combined income and therefore reduce the taxes that you eventually will owe. I mentioned combined income really encompasses quite a bit. There are some exclusions, and so we want to be aware of these because these are all just different levers that we can pull during the planning process to try and keep that combined income a bit lower. Uh, so there's six that we listed here. The one I want to focus on is just the Roth IRA and Roth 401k. This isn't saying everything should be coming through the Roth. You need to only use that, but it is just a conversation on tax diversification, having these different assets in different places that you have money and pulling on those to see if we can work to lower that combined income and possibly lower taxes. So another chance you really wanna plan, get individualized with this, sit down with a member of the team and kind of work through your unique situation. Matt, if I could interrupt uh, yeah. you for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. This, what, what you just went over is one of the areas where we tend to work closely with uh, our brothers and sisters on the accounting side. Okay. And we've we've seen um, a number of situations where it does or does not make sense to claim Social Security because of, of tax issues. We mm -hmm. also go through this in the opposite direction. So um, it's not uncommon for us to encounter someone that's in a very low tax bracket that doesn't have much of their Social Security uh, uh, taxable. And... Mm -hmm. What we find is, um, you know, as a, as a general rule of thumb, when, and of course, somebody's calling my, my office phone just at this time, right? Um, as a general rule of thumb, the, the, the way we approach uh, uh, investment management, especially, is we don't like to let a low tax bracket go to waste. So there's a number of things that we can do from a, a, a tax perspective uh, to take advantage of a low tax bracket. But we have found times where 
um, we may be doing something that has very little or no impact uh, in on the left hand, but on the right hand, it made the Social Security go from not being taxable at all to being taxed at, at the, the the largest possible level. And mm -hmm. so these are these are mistakes sometimes that uh, you can't undo. Uh, once once you move forward with certain types of planning, uh, you know you can't put the the, the sausage back in the casing. So uh, we we do uh, a lot of times speak with the you know, the accountants um, to make sure that as we're going through these planning steps, we're we're not being penny wise and pound foolish. And and you know this is I would say to anyone whether you're a client of both firms, one firm, neither firm, um, you really need to have your your planning side and your tax side in lockstep because little changes one way or another can actually make a big difference uh, when when you get your taxes done if you're if you're not planning ahead. Absolutely, yeah. And that's why we are always emphasizing the need for that professional advice and planning because this is a really complicated program. There's a lot of different things you need to factor in. And as, as Sal mentioned, you know, some of these are permanent or lasting. Uh, they can make a big impact on just how retirement goes. And so it is really important to sit down and get that planning happening as early as possible to make sure we're prepared for all these little intricacies of the Social Security program. Now, just moving on to the final thing here, we've obviously covered quite a bit when it comes to the different benefits entitled, kind of how the system works. But at the end of the day, the main question that people are asking is when should I claim Social Security? And that there isn't that rule of thumb, like Sal mentioned, you know, it, it is different for everyone. So we just want to give some general guidelines on the questions that we're asking uh, before we make that decision to claim. And I've mentioned these kind of throughout the presentation, but just want to put them all in one place. So that first one, how long will you work? Are you currently working? You know, we saw the earnings limit applies to all of these benefits. Uh, so we want to make sure that that's being planned out because there is that income threshold. If you hit that, you could see some of those benefits withheld. So we want to make sure we understand, are you working and are you planning on continuing to work? Next up is your withdrawal rate. So essentially, what percent of those assets do you need to live the lifestyle you're accustomed to each year? And so for that, we want to draw in all those outside assets, because again, Social Security is just one piece of the overall puzzle, and figure out how we can pull from those different assets to make sure that you are living the life that you want to live, and we have enough assets to keep that going. And then finally, looking at what is your expected or combined life expectancy. And this is an area people can run a lot of complicated break-even analysis, kind of get you a specific date. We want to keep things a little more high level. So just some general guidelines on how to claim Social Security. And what we want to look at is minimizing longevity risk. Uh, so one of the things, going back to my grandfather example, he was worried that he was going to pass away before he could get the most out of the system. What we're looking at in this age of people living quite a bit longer than they did in the past is we have several decades possibly into retirement, and we want to make sure that we're not outliving our benefits. And so that's called longevity risk. And these are some guidelines just to kind of minimize that. So if you're single, a bit more flexibility here. If you think you're going to have an average life expectancy, feel free to take that whenever you'd like. If you think you might live quite a bit, feel free to let social security grow as much as possible. Now for married couples, our general guideline is the spouse with the lower social security benefit, feel free to take that as soon as possible, but the spouse with the higher benefits, try and maximize those benefits as much as possible. And that just goes back to our survivor benefits discussion where the greater those benefits are, the greater survivor benefit that you can pass along. And so if you have the opportunity to maximize it, could pay dividends moving forward. Matt, um, if I could interrupt yes. you, we actually had a, yeah. a question come in uh, that is, th this is actually a pretty popular one for us. Mm -hmm. So if if the lower earning spouse has a relatively low uh, a full retirement age benefit, is there a reason not to start collecting at age six, 62 other than uh, for the the reduced benefit um, that, that you have? And um, I, I, I'd like to you know, get your perspective on this. I'd, I'd like to speak to this as well first. Um, we, we generally find that it is beneficial for that spouse to collect as soon as possible 
but there, there are some caveats in there. Um, we have had situations where clients have been in abnormally high tax brackets, and we look at the situation and say, well, while the spouse can collect, um, and you know, I'm going to use Jersey as, as an example, um, if we have a situation where you're, you're, you know, you're, you're in a higher federal bracket, odds are you're also in a higher Jersey bracket, uh, which means that you, know, you could easily see a 40 to 50% tax rate. And we don't really encourage people to, to collect Social Security if they're going to have a 50% tax rate because you're, you're losing so much uh, of that benefit. The, the other way we look at this is, is, is a bit goofy. Um, and and it's, it's something that, that I don't know that we actually talked about in this. But if, if you do the math of waiting uh, to turn your benefit on versus collecting as soon as possible. So... Um, starting at 62 versus waiting age 70. Um, it almost always works out that uh, if, if you live to about age 80, that's about the break even, uh, give or take a little bit. So we do get this question all the time of, you know, should one collect versus the other? And the answer is, in, in some ways, it depends. It depends on, you know, what we expect for um, both uh, the 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 spouses uh, from a life expectancy standpoint, it it, it depends on uh, your your tax returns and and where your taxes are going to be. But as a general rule, we do find that it you're you're better off collecting sooner rather than later. I don't, I don't know if if you have a different opinion on that. Yeah, so I think again, these are kind of those general guidelines, but I think that just goes back to the importance of really planning this out because I'm sure. For that person with the high tax bracket, you might not be thinking that suddenly just by getting into Social Security for that small amount of benefit, you could owe that tax bill on the other end. When it comes to the reason why we say that spouse with the lower Social Security can begin as soon as possible, you know, general guideline there. The reason we're looking at, though, is because there is a good chance that when that higher earning spouse turns on their benefits, there'll be that step up in spousal. There'll be that step up in survivor. And so the lower earners just has more flexibility while the higher earner has those kind of carry on effects passed down. And so that's why we really wanna try and maximize that higher earner as much as possible. Uh, but in terms of the break even, yeah, I think the, the fact that we have is if both you and your spouse have made it to age 65, there's a 50% chance that at least one of you makes it to age 90. And so there is just a lot more in terms of life in retirement these days um, but certainly there are those break-even type of analyses where if you can get specific with clients, you can dig into that a bit more. I think we just want to keep this as broad as possible and just general guidelines to consider. But it is a very unique thing to each client. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, that's actually the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for the time today. Um, Sal, thank you for the questions. But yeah, the thing that I would emphasize that we have all day is you know, don't just listen to your neighbors or your buddies, your pickleball partners, just the people you're meeting around town. You can see kind of how intricate things can get here. And this is something that is typically best left to the professionals. So find some time to sit down with Sal, with one of his team members at Cora Capital, and kind of have that personalized conversation. These discussions are incredibly important and do have very long lasting effects. By the way, I would like to add, if I am your pickleball partner, um, you can certainly ask me. Um, more likely than not, I will be your partner that's sitting on the side drinking a cold one, watching you fight it out. Because um, my wife doesn't let me participate in anything active anymore because I have a tendency to break things. Um, so uh, there, there, uh, I, well, actually not there. If, is there anyone, if you have any questions, if... Um, if you would like to uh, submit them, I would ask you to please do so uh, at this time. You know, it, it's really interesting, Matt, as, as you were going through the presentation, I was, I was thinking about some of the situations that you outlined. And it, it, it seems like after a 30 plus year career, I've had someone fall into a number of these different uh, situations. And there, there's, there's also a goofy one um, we've had a few clients that have actually had children later in life. Um, mm -hmm. 
usually, by the way, <laughs> let, let's be clear, um, their wife had a child um, and, and, and the husband um, uh, or the father may, may be uh, in their 50s or so when the child is born. And uh, what, what gets overlooked sometimes is that child could, could in theory, also qualify for a Social Security check um, when, when the person uh, turns on their income. So, so sometimes it's not just about a husband and wife. Sometimes you actually have to look at the child as well. Yes, and we can... Oh, you froze. Oh no, Matt froze. <laughs> Hopefully Matt comes back to us. Uh, at this time, does does anyone have any... Qu oh, you're back. Go ahead. Oh, yep, sorry. There you go. Uh, That's okay. I want, yes. Um, so yeah, we do have a part on the family benefits in that Social Security reference guide, and it does show that this does need to be a family-wide discussion. Yeah. We, we also had a situation several years ago and this particular client isn't on this call. So <laughs> I, I guess I can, I can bring this up, but um, we had someone that was actually getting ready to get married uh, for a second time um, mm -hmm. after being married to their first spouse for more than 10 years. And um, the wedding was scheduled uh, before she turned age 60. It's, probably one of the few times I was personally able to stop a wedding. <laughs> um, and um, they, they still had a, a heck of a reception, um, but uh, they, they officially got married, I think, you know, a little bit after she turned age 60. So, you know, there, there's, uh, and we've, we've, by the way, we've also had it the other way. We've also told people, you know, you might want to get married because, you know, there, there's a benefit to doing that as well. So. Yeah, we've definitely seen a couple of examples. I think I had one couple wait four or five years before they turned age 60 because, you know, it just depends on what those benefits could look like. But yeah, Social Security, a way to stop a wedding in a good way, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I always felt bad about that one, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at, at, at this point, I'm not seeing anyone that has um, raised their hand or uh, submitted a question. Um, and I don't want to keep people on the, the, the line here if they don't have. Uh, is, is, is anyone, if, if you want to um, submit a question real quick, uh, give you another few seconds. So as I had said at the beginning of the call, uh, we will be sending out uh, an email in short order. Uh, it will have a number of different handouts and, and some, some points uh, to take away from this presentation. We would also you know, very much ask if this is something that you're interested in speaking with us about, please do so. Uh, we do have uh, social security optimization software uh, that we can work with uh, you and, and your spouse, uh, if, if uh, that's appropriate, to uh, help figure out what may be the best solution for a family. Uh, it is somewhat interactive. It's something that, you know, while we can print you a hard copy report, it's also something that we can do on a screen share and actually show you uh, the pros and cons of, of claiming versus waiting and so forth. Nothing takes the place of an actual estimate from Social Security, I like to say that, um, but nonetheless, uh, we, we like to get it pretty close if we can. Um, okay, so we haven't had any additional uh, questions submitted. Matt, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. This has been really, really helpful, uh, and we look forward to having you back some other time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Happy to do this anytime. And thanks for everyone for attending. Thanks. And thanks to MFS for sponsoring this. Appreciate it. Of course. Take care. Right. Have a good one. Goodbye. Thanks, Al. Take care. Thank you.